This episode of the Integrated Music Teaching Podcast is proudly brought to you by Forte. You're listening to the Integrated Music Teaching Podcast from Top Music. Tune in weekly as we interview music teachers and experts from around the world to explore creative activities and ideas that build learning connections in students. Our integrated music teaching approach will deepen your students' understanding of musical concepts, engage them in critical thinking, improve their reading and performance, foster their curiosity, and prepare them for a lifetime of music making. Hi, teachers, and welcome back to the Integrated Music Teaching Podcast with me, Tim Topham, your host. It's great to be spending some time with you again today and my very special guest who I'll welcome in a moment. And we're continuing our theme for this month, which is all about playing by ear and singing and lead sheets and pop music and all those kind of fun topics. And my guest today and I are going to be unpacking a little bit more about getting students singing, which can always be a challenge, particularly if you've taken on transfer students or adults who never sang when they were younger. Uh, or if uh, your earlier lessons with students don't have too much singing in, it can be hard to add that later on. So it's one of the reasons why in my Notebook Beginners framework that any teacher can use for those beginning first lessons, we do lots of singing early on. So it just becomes a regular part of what goes on in music lessons. Now, before we jump in today, I've got a very exciting free event coming up. It's called our Teaching Popular Music by Ear One Day Challenge. Yes, we're just doing it all in one day. In fact, we're doing it all in one live session <laughs> with a little bit of homework for those people who would like to take up the challenge. Now, if you'd like to find out more, it's over at topmusic.co slash challenge. We're going to be meeting on Monday, the 22nd of May. That's at 6 p.m. Eastern time, which is 11 p.m. London. My Tuesday, the 23rd of May here at 8 a.m. in Australia. So it's the same time that I'm going and doing weekly lives in our Facebook group and on, and on our YouTube channel. So if you haven't caught up with those ones, weekly live events at this same time, 6 p.m. Eastern on Monday nights, I'm going live uh, just to chat about whatever we've been talking about on the blog and the podcast and on YouTube for teachers to ask questions. I've been currently focusing on this month's topic, which is all about chords and things. But that will change as we go into different topics for different months. So come and join us for those. They're just free chats over in our beginner and intermediate teacher Facebook group and over on YouTube. If you want to find out more, just check out our show notes for today's episode, which are at topmusic.co slash episode 329. But if you do want to come along to that event, which is this teaching popular music by ear one day challenge, what I'm going to be doing is pretty much what I do in my pop song solutions videos, which you may well have seen on social media and on YouTube where I respond or react to a YouTube of a song that a music teacher has told us that he or she's been asked to teach by her students and then work out how to teach it. Uh, so we're going to be doing that together at this one day challenge. And then I'm going to be challenging you to do the same thing yourself and then share the results with us. So it's going to be great fun. As I say, totally free. The details and the sign up is at topmusic.co slash challenge. And yes, we will offer replays for that. Our review this week is from, I think it's Zoe. Uh, it's always hard to know with um, these usernames through iTunes. But anyway, Zoe, I'm going to call this person Zoe anyway, says best podcast I've ever listened to. Where to start with reviewing Tim's podcast? This is a jam-packed, super engaging and incredibly helpful podcast for music teachers. I'm a new teacher of violin and I've been binging the podcast for the last few months. Each week, Tim interviews someone completely different. And the common denominator is a love of music education. Oh, wow. I could go on for days about the potty. Thank you, Tim, and the team. Highly recommended. Thank you so much, Zoe. Hope I've got your name right. If this sounds like your review and you're listening to this show, then please email us support at topmusic.co so we can send you a thank you gift for leaving your lovely review. And I would like to encourage any of our wonderful listeners out there if you haven't reviewed our podcast please take the time it only takes a few minutes and we really appreciate it, it does help us get uh, higher in rankings and hopefully be seen by more other teachers who we can help as well if you'd like to find out how to leave a review and you're not too sure you can find out all about it at topmusic.co slash itunes my guest today, John Henney, is a leading vocal coach in the music industry with over 25 years of experience and renowned for his teaching skills. His techniques are designed to maintain vocal health, improve overall sound quality, eliminate voice cracks and extend the singer's range, allowing them to express themselves without limitation. John Henney is not only an accomplished vocal coach, but also a respected lecturer 
who has spoken at renowned colleges and institutes like USC, Paul McCartney's Liverpool Institute of the Arts, and the Academy of Contemporary Music in England. He is also a master teacher for vocal coaches worldwide, conducting annual teaching engagements in Europe, Australia, and New Zealand. Welcome to the show, John Henney. Great to have you here. Thank you for having me. Now, some listeners may not be aware of the voice coaching royalty that we have on the show today. So I think you better give everyone a little bit of an overview of your background and also what you do day to day. Yeah, I've been teaching voice for over 30 years now, and I also train other voice teachers. I've worked with hundreds of other voice teachers. I've worked with um, some celebrity clients, clients on Broadway, voiceover actors, as well as hobbyists and beginning singers. And one of my main passions is voice science and helping people understand how the voice works. It's a rather complicated instrument. It's not quite like guitar or piano. And I feel that the more you understand your voice, the better you can work it and take care of it. It's a wonderful instrument to have inside your body. But I, I agree, anytime I've had any sort of vocal training, and I haven't had a significant amount, it's really complicated uh, to learn just what goes on and how to control it. Uh, so I, I think that's right, going down the right path is trying to help people understand that uh, better. And did you grow up um, singing or were you an instrumentalist originally? Yeah, so growing up, my, I would attempt to sing. And my dad, who was from Glasgow, Scotland, was a, was a very natural singer. And he would hear my poor attempts and say in his fatherly Glaswegian way, that's bloody terrible. So <laughs> I started playing drums at age 11. And I played drums professionally from my late teens all through, in, through my uh, 20s into my early 30s. And in my early 20s, a roommate of mine, said, hey, I've, I've started taking voice lessons and, and this guy's teacher works with Stevie Wonder. And I said, well, that's good enough for me. Let me see if I can learn to sing, maybe get uh, some more gigs, singing backup vocals, et cetera. And within a couple of years, I moved from playing the drums to being a lead singer. That's quite a change of instrument. I mean, a lot of people, I, I, am a, I have played the drums and percussion, so I don't think this myself, but I think a lot of people look down on drummers as being a kind of simple Maybe a bit easier than a lot of instruments to play. And then going right to the other end of the spectrum, I mean, high quality operatic musical theatre singing, any of those, that's incredibly challenging work. Did you go through any other instruments in the process? Yeah, I mean, I play piano well enough to teach and um, I love to bang around on guitar, although I don't think I would take my talents on stage. I sure do love it. Yep, you've got a guitar in the background. I can see the neck of it sticking up. And I saw on your website that you're a vocal coach as well, and I wondered if you could explain the difference between vocal teaching and vocal coaching. Yeah, well, they're kind of used interchangeably, and especially in popular music, the, the terms are kind of blurred. In classical music, it's, it's much more refined. A voice teacher works on technique. And a vocal coach works on repertoire. And a, a great vocal coach will sometimes special in one, specialize in one type of music. They tend to be very good piano players. So there, there is a difference. I, I kind of use it interchangeably just because I also work with speakers. And so they like to, you know, professional speakers, voice users, not singers. And, so the word vocal coach tends to resonate more with them rather than voice teacher. Mm, and so I might get a vocal coach if I was given a role in an opera and I never sang an operatic aria before, for example, there'd be a specialist I could go to. That's kind of co more the coaching. Yeah, there are specialists in certain operas in certain roles. Really? So you, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Wow. In terms of coaching, it, that, that gets really deep on the classical side. That's incredibly specialized. I imagine, though, that someone going, getting the lead role in a musical theatre production, The Phantom, or lead in, in any musical, would get a lot of value from someone who specialised in that particular role. I didn't know that was actually a thing. Yeah. I mean, 
voice teachers and voice coaches in musical theater, they'll kind of trade back and forth in that a voice teacher will do a certain amount of coaching and coaches will do a certain amount of technical work. But to really get somebody, if you really want to nail it, I would recommend working with both. Mm. Oh, I look, I love interviewing singing teachers. I had Nikki Loney on the podcast a little while ago. I know ago. Nikki. You may know Nikki. She was fantastic. Yeah. Uh, and I think we kind of get each other. We both play an instrument, mainly piano. We kind of, there's some similarities in our teaching, I think. And we often accompany singers and help each other out, certainly in schools anyway. But what I want to talk about today is is more about playing by ear and accompanying ourselves as pianists, which is an area that you have some interest in and some skills in. Later this month, we've got an amazing course coming out uh, by Simon Rushby for our members all about uh, step-by-step playing by ear and approaches that you can use when kids want to learn something, a pop song or something that you don't want to teach by sheet music or can't find a music for. Do you uh, agree that playing by ear is an important skill for instrumental musicians? I guess, actually, thinking about it, there's probably not an equivalent for singers because you always do things by ear. Would that be right? Well, yes, um, singers do, although you get singers, especially if you're working in in session work, et cetera, where sight reading is incredibly important. But I recommend that all singers learn to play an instrument. And usually the guitar is the most fun. I love guitar because simple things sound really cool on guitar. Simple things on piano tend to sound simple. However, piano is so visual and it's laid out so well. And you can really see the way music is put together on the piano. And also playing a physical instrument is just going to lock in things like rhythm in a different way. When you're, when you're strumming on a guitar, that rhythm is really getting into your body. And to be able to hear what's going on in music, to know you're listening and you go, oh, wait a minute, now there's a flat seven and suddenly the, the vibe of the music changes. It gets a little bit more blues, funk, rock, like you, you just hear those things. Um, go up the four chord, you suddenly hear that minor and that melancholy, and it's gonna just change the way you approach the vocal. So I think it's incredibly important for singers to really work on the musicianship. And, and likewise, I think we both agree that musicians or instrumentalists should all sing. So why, why does playing by ear, we're talking instrumental now, and singing, why do they go together so well? And why do they rely on each other? Well, because playing by ear, it shouldn't be hunt and peck, right? You should know your ear should be leading your fingers. And the ear needs to lead the voice. We don't have direct control of this instrument. It's, it's rather indirect. You know, wiggling our toes and fingers, that's very direct. It, we, it's very visceral. We can see them. We feel it. Whereas with the voice, we don't feel these little muscles that are doing all this work. So it's really tying the mind to this instrument. So the more that you work on playing by ear, the more secure these pitches and sequences are going to be in your mind, which means the more secure they are going to be in your voice. And what do you mean by hunt and peck? You used that phrase before. And what's the better way? Yeah, so playing by ear would be, oh, I like this song. Let me just bang. Oh, here's the first chord. Let me just play every chord I know until I find the second chord. <laughs> yeah. The better way to be go would be, okay, that, uh, that's the one chord. Oh, I hear that as the four. So the second chord is the four chord of that key. So that the ear and the, the ability to hear music is what leads you rather than just having to go with the instrument and trying to find it. Yeah. Do you think there's any good that can come out of the hunt and peck trying to just match and play? Sure. That, that's going to be the way you start. And so you're, unless you are really blessed uh, by nature with, with perfect pitch, but even then you need to understand it the construct of music. But yeah, getting in there and playing around. And I, I tell people, especially with an instrument, just have fun as part of your practice and make noise, see what it can do. Just have a go at it and have fun. And then 
then go back to, okay, this is how it's, it's constructed. I get, tend to get frustrated with my son who has tried a number of different instruments. He's 13 now. He's played about four different instruments and had lessons on them all and isn't currently learning anything at the moment, uh, but does go to the piano and do what you said, just kind of noodles around. And that's, it's some, it's, in some ways I'm kind of frustrated. It's like, oh, you could be learning actually what you're doing. But then other people tell me, no, that's good. He's, he's not, there's no pressure. He's just going and sitting there and making stuff up and doodling around. And I think that's what you're kind of saying, that you need to find that fun in the experience that you have with your instrument. And as he doodles around, he's going to start to realize there are reoccurring patterns. And then he's going to want to know, well, wait, why does, why does this pattern work better than this pattern? And he's going to find his way in to theory and education and understanding. Mm. This is a different way to approach it, I guess. And you, you mentioned as well, sort of one chords, four chords, hearing those things. I, and I, my approach to teaching is very chordal and I encourage teachers to help students understand the chordal harmonic nature of music. It is super critical. Do you have, and I know you don't teach piano as such, but I want to talk about this accompanying, uh, encouraging guitarists and pianists to accompany themselves is one way of getting more singing, but it's, you know, it's just, it's fun. What, what are some of those steps that you take firstly, just in the playing by ear to hear the bass movement? for students because that can be challenging. I tend to hum bass lines when I listen to music. I don't know why. It's kind of weird and everyone finds it kind of annoying, but I really like it. I should have been a bass player, I think, John. Um, what, how do you go about helping students with that? Well, obviously I'm not a piano teacher, but what I encourage singers to do is to learn their major scales at least, and, it, and even just start off with their C major scale. And then Go ahead and harmonize that scale. So you have the one chord, two, three, four, and then you can start to see like, oh, wait a minute, this, this one to five to six to four. Oh, that's this song, but it's also this song. It's also this song. It's also this song. And they start to see like, oh my goodness, I can start to play a lot of songs very quickly. And then once they can start to play even just simple blocking chords and learn some simple inversions, now you can start to, to really feel the rhythm and you can start to interact with the music in a completely different way. It, it will really change your singing, even just playing an instrument on a basic level, and it's going to increase your hearing. So yeah, I'm, I'm a big proponent of learning chords and being able to play from from lead sheets. If you can just do that, you can in popular music, you can play most songs that that you're going to want to sing. Mm, absolutely. I was just doing a live stream this morning about some of my lead the lead sheet resources that I like using. Uh, and I, I think it's easy for uh, teachers, listeners, piano teachers in particular, to think lead sheets and associate it with real book and fake books and those jazz books and everything's about jazz. And that's not quite right, is it? The, we don't have to be talking about complex 11th slash nine augmented chords, just simple chords, right? It's just simple chords. And, you know, today's popular music harmonically has gotten simpler than maybe 30 years ago, but the production is a bit more complex and there's different sounds and different textures. And so if you're having flat nines in the chord, it's probably going to start to clash with all these other sounds. So I, I don't view that. I, I'm not judgmental about music and, and what people want to listen to. But what I am saying is you can, it, it, the price of entry has almost been reduced in terms of if you want to sing popular music and what's happening now, it's, it's not as sophisticated. It's not like, you know, a David Foster, Whitney Houston ballad that's going to go through key changes. And so you can, you can get, you can get in there and start having fun pretty quick. And those standard progressions, like the one you mentioned, there's about three of them, I think four, maybe that just come up all the time over and over. And, uh, it's, it's one of the crucial things that I encourage teachers to teach their students, learn those key pop song progressions because students, well, they love them too. It's really instructive in just being able to hear harmony. So I'm with you on all of that. 
I guess uh, I want to just talk some practicalities because I think listeners will be thinking about two things when it comes to their student singing and accompanying themselves. One is how do I get my students singing at all? If they haven't done it from the very beginner lessons, it can be hard. Or if they're taking on a transfer adult or teenager, that can be hard. So thoughts on that. And then some steps to getting them accompanying themselves. Yeah, well, singing, one of the key things that you're doing when you're teaching somebody to sing is you're actually helping to registrate their voice. Voices are going to hit a wall, if you will, where they will either start to shout and strain or the voice is going to go quite weak and into falsetto. We'll sometimes call that a flip. And so it is learning to dial in this transition from their lower to their upper register. And a lot of that has to do with vowel tuning. And if you want to start teaching people to sing, if you just start to understand the acoustics of the voice, that, that's really what, what makes this instrument so tricky, is the acoustic shift that needs to occur. And in really simple terms, you're primarily going in a lower register from a resonance in the vocal tract that is boosting the voice in one way. And then there is a handover to a higher resonance and that becomes the primary booster. And what people do is they try and keep this lower resonance and drive it up the whole way. And the way that they try and raise that resonance is by squeezing at the throat and widening their mouth. And that hits a wall. So just learning some basic acoustics, you can, you can help people pretty quickly without having to spend years learning to be a voice teacher. You just want to help your students on the fly. And I'm sorry, the second part of your question? Um, oh, get them playing. Get them playing. Yeah. Actually, let's come back to that because I want to dig a little bit deeper because I kind of, not being a vocal specialist, I kind of think, oh, yeah, just, just sing. <laughs> Here's a note. Just sing it. Um, yeah, but you're you're and and I think there's a, a challenge for us too as as teachers of children that their voices change over time, particularly boys, obviously, and finding the right uh, register, would you call it, to work with can also be a challenge. So let's say we've we've taken on a, a student who is uh, I don't know a, a, a child, so eight years old, obviously have a higher voice. What a, would you sort of as a piano, I know you're not a piano teacher, but as an instrumental teacher, would you have them just singing some simple tunes with you? Mary had a little love, or, you know, things like that. Just, just something to get them singing. Yeah, what you do is get them singing songs they like, uh, especially with children that young. I, I work scales a little bit. Uh, what I tend to do is get them into a song, and then when they start to have a little bit of trouble, just a quick shift to the scale to help them find that balance and then back into the song. Um, as you know, working with children on any instrument, it really is this, this uh, give and take between them having fun, them having fun, and then you slip in a bit of hard work and then back yeah. to having fun. <laughs> uh, so you don't lose their interest and the same goes for voice. Mm. And by scale, you mean li literally singing the notes of a scale. In order yeah, to and the voice. I mean, the... we we will use different scales uh, depending on what it is that that we're trying to do. In the voice, if you're if you're doing something stepwise like diatonic, depending on where you are, that can actually be a little harder because you're having to make smaller adjustments. So sometimes triads, arpeggios can work a bit better. And in general, if, if somebody's being really heavy in their voice and, and is having a lot of tension, rather than starting um, the scale, you know, ma, 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 and they're, and they're pulling, start on the top. Ma, 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 can help encourage them to, to lighten up. And so there's, there's different tricks you can use. Forte is the perfect solution for music teachers looking to build or grow their online music studio. With their revolutionary platform, music teachers can connect with a high volume of students from all over the world. Forte has already connected over 60,000 lessons and more than 3 million minutes of music instruction to date with teachers from over 90 countries. Forte's extensive network of students provides music teachers with an unparalleled opportunity to expand their reach to more students. 
And once you're connected to more students, Forte's platform allows you to teach on an industry-leading video conferencing system purpose-built for music lessons. It offers Forte pure audio for crystal clear sound quality and other features that allow you to do your best teaching online, plus intuitive tools for building and scheduling. Now, music teachers can find students, teach and manage their business efficiently all in one place. Visit ForteLessons.com to learn more about their platform and how it can help you grow and run a successful online music studio. Do you like those, some of those fun vocal warm-ups that choirs use? Warm-ups before musical theatre productions. Da 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 dum bum bum. And there's you know there's quirky ones and things like that. Do you, do you see a value of those in a private lesson in just students having kind of enjoying the experience of singing? Sure. Yeah. Whatever keeps it fun. And actually, vocal warm-ups. I mean, it's kind of like a stretch out. They they figure it takes around five minutes or so for the voice to be warmed up. Uh, the latest research that I've seen, no more than ten minutes. And yeah, you're just you're just getting these these little ligaments, muscles, and tissue ready for the work ahead. And if you could make them fun, great. <laughs> All right. So we've talked about the younger child. What about an older teenager? So either a boy or a girl, for that matter, or even an adult much more self-conscious, haven't done a lot of singing before, but they've come to you for an instrumental lesson, guitar or piano or something, and you really feel passionate about voice and singing and, and want to help them with that. That's, uh, and I assume you start, you've, you've taught this age group from scratch. Um, any sort of tricks? Because that can be a bit of a challenge. Yeah, so there's going to be challenges um, for each group. When you have a voice, that has been affected by testosterone, the vocal folds are going to grow longer. The Adam's apple protrudes and you get, because now the vocal folds or the vocal cords are so much longer, there tends to be a real break between the, the lower and the upper register and, and the balance of these muscles still needs to be worked out. Also, the reason babies can scream all night and not lose their voice is the vocal folds are very, very soft. It's like they have boxing gloves on. And when you're a teenager, the folds have stiffened, but not to the point that they are later on. And then the vocal folds continue to stiffen as you age, and that becomes a problem. But they're still rather soft, which makes the voice rather unstable. Um, in female voices, uh, you don't get the protrusion of the Adam's apple, but actually the larynx will get wider it's more rounded and the vocal cords have further to travel to get to center so they will often deal with issues of breathiness so you have to do a lot of exercises to encourage uh vocal fold closure okay and in a in a lesson just while they're learning an instrument what kind of things have you seen work teachers might be able to do uh, you know we said singing a popular song but you know, I, I, we could get a teenager to sing a pop song that they like, I guess, or sing along to the original, or would you play the chords and sing with them? I mean, if you, any kind of tips? Because I think it's it's a big leap to make for a lot of teachers to get kids vocalizing. Singing. It is. There's a couple of, of quick tricks you can do. If you have a student and they're really breathy and they're really quiet, you can use, have them sing on a really bratty, Hey, sound almost like a <laughs> like a cartoon character. I say, you know, do SpongeBob. Although now that's starting to be too old for kids. But, hey, Patrick, and so that will encourage that vocal fold closure. If you have uh, somebody whose voice is really tight and they're really squeezing, I tell them, Don't sing like Patrick. Hey, SpongeBob. And what that's <laughs> going to do is it's going to drop the larynx right, and all of a sudden they get a little bit of that dopey, and that's going to relax that tension on the vocal folds. And the other thing is if, if let's say there's a vowel sound that, that works well for them. I, I like to use the B of book. That tends to, the B gives a little more vocal fold closure. It helps the larynx stabilize. The U is a very neutral vowel. So it tends to uh, tune in well through those transitions and have them sing rather than the words, have them sing the melody on B while they're playing. Give them, give them a sound they can get their voice working well because language kind of conspires against us. There are certain vowel sounds that are harder to sing in parts of the voice than others. So just using a singular sound can help. 
Uh, so b- a book, uh, ba, ba and la. I mean, I hear that a lot. The A is. You is can, that- yeah. The, the A vowel, if someone's really breathy, the A can work. If somebody ch- is, tends to want to shout, the A can be problematic just because acoustically that's going to lend itself to shouting on the higher notes. So you could, let's say somebody has got to sing their low notes and their, um, you can have them doing that. Ba, ba, ba. And then they got to do some high notes and you go to, bu, 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 you know, and have them jump to the different sounds. And that, that can actually help them begin to registrate and tune into these different registers. Funny you mentioned, I just, just remember you mentioning the baby crying. I'd never actually thought. Why don't they lose their voice? That's really interesting. Oh, dear. Yeah, I'd seen different theories that if you watch babies' bellies, they know how to breathe and, and you've got to discover the breathing secrets of babies. But it really is their, their vocal folds are really, really soft. And so the, the collisions that they're experiencing or creating don't cause the swelling that they do in older, that it would in older voices. I have to encourage listeners interested in the voice to look at YouTube's of the vocal folds in action. I think it's fascinating. I mean, it's such an alien looking thing. It's bizarre that this is inside us and we use it every single day. If you've never seen it, the first time I saw it, I could not believe it. And then when I had a lot of listeners will remember my vocal polyps and my story and uh, having a camera put down my up my nose while I'm speaking to look at my vocal folds, that was fascinating. I, yeah, I think this is really interesting. Yeah, it's wonderful. And if you think about it, they're the size of your thumbnail, and yet they can have a three octave range. And this instrument can carry over an orchestra unamplified. It's quite fascinating. And we still, we still don't know exactly how it works in certain aspects. I watch voice scientists argue we we still don't know exactly how the voice produces harmonics we know how it happens on a stringed instrument but there there are things about the voice it's absolutely fascinating what this instrument can do <laughs> amazing it's so easy to damage too though I, I i think of my time at schools i've taught in a lot of schools and hearing and i've taught pe before as well and i've had to really be careful to not shout yeah, PE teachers just wreck their voices without even thinking about it, unfortunately. I've learned, learned a lot over my experience. The second part of my earlier question was some steps to get guitarists and pianists accompanying themselves, more, more sort of uh, practical steps. We've talked a little bit about you know, learning some basic chords, but would you have them sort of vocalize the boo-boo at the top or sing a well-known folk tune, all kinds of things? Yeah, I'd say get a get a song that you like and learn the chords and then learn just some basic rhythm patterns. R- rhythm is something and musicians will make jokes about singers. There's drummer jokes, there's also singer jokes. <laughs> and, but rhythm is sometimes something that that is lacking in vocalists because it's not inherent to our instrument, right? Drummers are learning it right off the bat. Even guitarists with your strumming patterns. I mean, you're working those rhythms into your body. And so I would learn very simple patterns. Get, get a song with simple chords, get the pattern going, and then get the song as an instrumentalist committed to muscle memory. Because when you are singing and playing at the same time, the voice is going to take more of your bandwidth just because of the way that you're dealing with with notes, we don't press a key and, and have it stay in tune. The voice, we're constantly having to monitor it for, for pitch. We also have language, remembering lyrics, all of these things. So you're going to, anyone who plays and sings at the same time, most of what they're paying attention to is the singing and the instrument will be on autopilot. That's why I have to, when I'm accompanying musical theater, sing along all the time love to do <laughs> i'm really looking at the chords i'm not looking at the music chords and a rhythm pattern as you say and i'm reading the lyrics and tr- and trying to sing the tune i don't actually know i mean that's a super it's like a drummer trying to do you know so many different things tapping your head rubbing your tummy uh i don't know how the brain actually computes it all together 
Yeah, the brain's got to put some of it on autopilot. I mean, I played drums and sang all the time, and it was because drumming was completely on autopilot. It's, you know, and they've done brain scans of somebody trying to learn to play a major scale, and there's lots of brain activity. But then when they do it on a professional pianist, it's barely a, a register because it's just so ingrained. Get something simple and then really work it until you don't have to think about it and then start adding the vocals to it. And what do you think the advantages will, teachers would see if they do get their students, one, singing more and two, exploring accompanying themselves? Well, number one, I think they're going to see increased retention. Uh, if the student is open to it, they're going to have more fun. The, the first instrument was singing. And we don't really know which came first, singing or speech, but also the way we process music, we believe comes from singing. And even the way we derive scales, yes, scales come from the overtone series, but there are parts of it they think actually come from the patterns of speech. And that's why certain cultures have different sounding music than others, because it's tied into the language and even even major and minor. Why do we hear minor is sad? My dog's not feeling well. Hey, my gift is here, right? We, we, we use different intervals. And so we process that emotionally. So when you bring the voice into music, it just becomes more fun. And then being able to accompany yourself, being able to hear something, a song you like, and sit down and figure it out, your students are really eager to do that. And as they work through the Alfred book and, and these books that of course give us very good grounding in the instrument, they're also going home and they're trying to figure out how do I play this song? How do I play that song? So I always encourage people, if they're learning piano, Learn chords, learn structure. Even if you're learning to read, beautiful. And you're, and you're walking through step-by-step step these course books, do some extracurricular work and l learn to play from, from lead sheets, from chord sheets. Be able, somebody throws in front of you and it just has, you know, one, four, five. In any key, you would know what to play. And you can start to create parts and, and rhythm parts from that. I can't summarize it any better. I think that's a great way to wrap things up, John. Uh, and these are all things as well that don't have to take up whole lessons. You can do elements of this three minutes at the start of a lesson, five minutes to get students in the mindset, thinking musically, experiencing music, and then you can go on to those other things. Uh, so I really appreciate your time today, John. Thank you for that. Uh, where can people find out more about you and the work that you're doing? Yeah, I am at johnhenny.com, J-O-H-N-H-E-N-N-Y. And uh, you can look me up. I'm on YouTube and Facebook, Instagram. Just look up John Henny. There's not a lot of us. You'll find me. <laughs> you got a podcast as well, haven't you? Oh, I do. Yeah. Uh, the Intelligent Vocalist. Yes. And so um, if you're interested there. in reading, <laughs> if you want to know more about the voice as a, as a music teacher, my book teaching contemporary singing. And I also have another book, Beginning Singing. They're both on Amazon. And um, Beginning Singing, even though I wrote it for the beginner, it, it does explain a lot of these uh, kind of advanced concepts. And as a matter of fact, if you go to johnhenny.com, right there on the front page, you can get a, a free digital copy of the book. Oh, fantastic. That's great. Well, I hope um, people who are interested in this, particularly voice teachers out there, because I know we do have lots of our teachers teach both um have got some value from our conversation today thank you for joining me today john it's been great to catch up with you and uh, we look forward to keeping in touch thank you so much i really enjoyed it well i hope today's episode was a good reminder again of the power and importance of singing in your music lessons i know it does seem hard sometimes to get your students singing if it's not something that you've always done or that the student's been exposed to and they may be quite nervous about it. But do try some of those ideas we talked about today and in our other episodes about singing. We've got quite a few of them on the podcast. If you want to find out more about the episodes on singing and getting students singing that we've shared before, then head over to our show notes for today's episode where we're going to add a list. That's at topmusic.co slash episode 329. And over on the guitar podcast this week with Michael Gumley, 
you can check out his episode number 49 on music theory made fun with Zach from Musago, which is an Australian company, quite new and doing some great things with music theory. So that's a great one to go and check out. You can search for the Top Music Guitar Podcast on whatever podcast app you are listening to this show on today. Well, that's the end of the show for this week. Thanks again for joining us. It's been wonderful to hang out with you. Next week on the podcast, we're going to be hearing from the amazing Joseph Hoffman, who you may have heard of, The Hoffman Method and uh, Mr. Hoffman's Music. We're going to be talking about playing by ear from lesson one and how he does it and some of the ideas that Joseph has from his many, many years of experience. I'm Tim Topham and you've been listening to the Integrated Music Teaching Podcast. Speak to you next time. How do you keep up to date with all the latest trends and research in music education? How do you connect with other teachers around the world and make sure your teaching stays fresh and relevant for students of all ages and stages both now and into the future? I created our Top Music Pro membership to be the one-stop shop for music teaching resources, training, support and community and I'd love for you to come and join us inside. With over 40 comprehensive training courses, hundreds of teaching demonstrations and lesson plans, free monthly sheet music, discounts and all the business and pedagogy support you could ever need, Top Music Pro is the community you've been looking for. If you're ready to level up your learning from the podcast and join thousands of other teachers in our global network, head over to topmusicpro.com today. If you enjoy this show and want to hear more of our work, be sure to subscribe to this podcast wherever you're listening today. For links and resources mentioned in this episode, visit us at topmusic.co slash podcast or check out the show notes. I'm Tim Topham and this is the Integrated Music Teaching Podcast, a production of Top Music. Thank you so much for listening. Enjoy your week ahead and I'll catch you next time.